we calculated the energies. Well, we'll do an example then. We'll look at the uh, calculating the velocity of an ejected electron and figuring out the minimum energy required from the homework. Okay. When this comes up. All right, uh, let's take a look at number 18. Um, the minimum energy required to cause the photoelectric effect in potassium metals is 3.69 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. 3.69 times 10 to the minus 19 joules means that ener any energy less than 3.69 times 10 to the minus 19 joules uh, will not, and any energy greater than or equal to will. Will photoelectrons be produced when visible light shines on the surface of potassium? What was the energy range? The energy range was between 1.5 to 3.8 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So will visible light do it? Yes and no. It depends. Lower energy visible light will not we'll have to have higher energy visible light. And so what is, what is the higher energy visible light that we're going to need? And so one thing that we like to do is we like to think in terms of the energy, in terms of individual and per mole. And so um, 3.69 times 10 to the minus 19 joules is in the visible range because it was 1.5 times 10 to the minus 19 joules, is that correct? To 3.8 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And so 3.5 is somewhere in here. 3.5. And so up here, yes. Below here, no. Will photoelectrons be produced when visible light on the surface? Y yes, uh, if it's higher, high enough in energy. If 520 nanometer radiation is shown on potassium, what is the velocity of the ejected uh, electrons? And so 520 nanometers is what color light, roughly? What color light is um, this? You know, normally we go Roy G. Bibb. And so this is 390. This is 760. To make life easier, we'll just call that roughly 400 and 800. And so 500 is around where? And so this is 400, 500, 600, 700, 800. So we'll divide this into quarters, roughly. So 500, 600, 700. And so 500 nanometer light is in the blue indigo violet region. You see that? And so this is blue indigo violet. Should that work in that region? Yeah, this should be sufficient energy. Well, what is the energy of this photon? The energy of this photon, let's go ahead and calculate it, is equal to what?
3.82? Yes. Okay, times 10 to the negative 19 joules. That's more than enough because we only need 3.69 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. About 3. Um, so we have more than enough energy, right? We have excess energy. And so out of this um, energy here, I just I didn't want to erase that, but let me help it with one thing. Out of this energy here, um, we're going to use 3.69. So 3.82 times 10 to the minus 19 joules of available energy. 3.69 times 10 to the minus 19 joules was required for ionizing. Or, so that leaves us with 0. One three times ten to the minus nineteen joules of excess energy. That excess energy is going to be um, converted into kinetic energy for the electron. So we're just going to kick the electron off faster. Is that right? Okay. Well, how how fast is that electron going to be ejected by? And so the kinetic energy is equal to one half m u r mu squared. I have to do RMS. RMS is for the gases. So one half mu squared. Well, here we have 0.13. And so u, the velocity, is going to equal the square root of uh, 2 times the kinetic energy divided by the mass of the electron. The mass of the electron has to be in um, kilograms. And so I have to look that up, unfortunately. I don't have that number memorized. Alright, so what we do is we'll plug it in. 2 times the kinetic energy, 0.13 times 10 to the minus 19. Now joules is a kilogram meter squared per second squared, divided by the mass. The mass of electron is 9.109 times 10 to the minus 31. 9.109 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Take the square root of that. So the kilograms cancel, which means this is meter squared per second squared. Can somebody calculate this? Meters per second. Wow. Is that what other people got? meters per second. Okay. It's fast. Huh. Um, that's being ejected with pretty high velocity. Let's take a look at let's go back to it. Let's 
still in prelude. <coughs> They don't give us the velocities here. All right. Well, that's what we got. That's what we got. Assuming we didn't do any uh, calculation errors. That's what we got. Um, we also have to get comfortable. And, you know, this is joules per photon or joules per ejected electron. We also have to get comfortable in, in terms of joules per mole. And so if I needed this um, energy in... Um, Joules per mole or kilojoules per mole, what would the energy here be? So 3.69 times 10 to the minus 19 joules per photon or per ejected electron is the same as how many kilojoules per mole. So can you take that number and multiply by Avogadro's number and see what it comes out to? How many kilojoules per mole did you get? Let's just say 222.2 kilojoules per mole. This is what we call the ionization energy. Or potassium metal. That's how much energy it takes to ionize. 220 22 kilojoules. Red light's not enough. You know, red light had like 157 kilojoules per mole. That wasn't enough to ionize this. Well, we're going to do one more application because dealing with these energies can be tricky sometimes. And so let's take a look at uh, how much energy it takes to break a bond. This is from chapter 10. To break a carbon-carbon single bond costs 347 kilojoules per mole. Carbon-carbon yeah, um, carbon -carbon single bonds occur in DNA. So... Um, let me ask you something like this. Uh, this bond here. Let's look at this bond. Like, this is called a peroxide bond. Hydrogen peroxide has an H-O-O-H linkage like this. A peroxide bond will red light break the peroxide bond. Well, how much energy does red light have? 157 roughly. So red light is plenty enough to break peroxide. So you have to you have to protect peroxide from light. How about uh, iodine? If we have iodine, will light break iodine? Bond? Not red. Maybe not the lowest energy red, but a little higher energy red. Yeah, no problem. Iodine you have to protect from light because light has more than this many kilojoules. How about bromine? Do we have to protect bromine from light? Well, uh, what's violet light? What's the energy for violet light? What 
doesn't help me. How many how many kilojoules per mole at the edge of violet? Yeah. 336. 336. Do we have to protect bromine from light? Yeah. Violet light will break it, blue light will break it, probably green light will probably break this. If we, it, you know, this is why, have you ever seen a photographer's darkroom? The photographer's darkroom has what color light? Red. Why do, they, why do you think they use red light in the photographer's darkroom? Because of photographic film, you know? They, they use red light, so because if you get higher and higher energies of light, you're going to expose the film prematurely. So you, you, they need light, otherwise they can't work in the dark, so they can use red light. Red light's going to cause the least amount of damage. Right? Red light's not going to be enough, so if, if, if you um, stored your bromine in a red light room, then you probably don't need to protect it from light. Right? How about... Um, Carbon-carbon bonds. Carbon-carbon bonds are found in your DNA. Do you have to protect your DNA from visible light? No. We don't have to protect it from visible light, but um, maybe we have to protect it from, well, actually, what wavelength of light, you know, what wavelength of light is required to break the carbon-carbon bond? So let's do that calculation right here. What lambda is required to do a break a carbon carbon bond? A typical carbon carbon bond is three hundred and forty seven kilojoules per mole. So what a lot of people do is this. A lot of people, they, you know, uh, energy is equal to h nu, which is equal to hc over lambda. So we want to solve for lambda. Lambda is just hc over the energy. Well, h is Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 um, joules per, uh, joules times seconds times the speed of light, which is 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, divided by the energy. Energy is 347 kilojoules. And so what we'll do here is I'm going to, I'm going to convert this into joules. So what do we get as far as lambda goes? Somebody have it? Five point seven one nine. 
the units would be meters. Everything should calculate, cancel out. And so what kind of light is that? So let's go back and look. The electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so times 10 to the negative 31 meters, well, kind of gamma ray then around 10 to the minus 16 meters. And so 10 to the minus 31 would be way out here. What kind of light is that? 10 to the minus 31 meters. It would, be, um, would that just be a super gamma ray? Cosmic ray? Super super gamma ray? No. That, you know, that would be kind of the end of the world photon. That's what it would be. The end of the world photon. Because that, that photon packed so much punch. It'd be the end. And um, Actually, I, I made a mistake here. I made a mistake because I'm not paying attention to energies. You know, when I'm dealing with energies, there are two, three, three, two, two or three ways we look at energy, right? We look at the um, individual photon energy, right? We look at the photon energy per mole, and we look at the um, we look at the uh, total energy based on how many photons we have, like joules per second, 100 joules per second. I'm asking an awful lot for this photon. You know what I'm asking this photon to do? This is, I, I call this the end of the world photon because this photon is expected to do a lot. This photon, think about this. Th you have one super photon, this one super photon you're going to have a mole of carbon-carbon bonds, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd carbon bonds. And so what you want is you want this one super photon to annihilate one mole of carbon-carbon bonds, which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And so this is one photon doing all that. Well, it, it turns out it doesn't work like that. This is one, I guess you can't even call it one mega photon. And mega is even too light because this one mega photon to break 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd bonds. This is just not going to happen. And so it doesn't light doesn't work this way. What happens is this: um, to break one bond requires one photon. We call this quantum stoichiometry. So what happens is, think about this. If I get a bigger and bigger photon, can I knock, can one, one photon, let's go back to potassium metal, can one photon with enough energy knock three electrons off? No. No, what happens is that one high energy photon knocks one electron off and just kicks it off with high velocity. That's it. And so quantum stoichiometry is like this, one photon per one electron or one bond. You know, or one photon, and this is bond broken, per one electron ejected. And so you can't have one photon knock two electrons off. It doesn't work that way. And so in your book, in the homework, it says, uh, you, know, um, you know, maybe somebody can kill, like they have this old expression, kill, kill two birds with one stone, you know? But in quantum, you can't. It's just one for one. And so this is wrong, you know? What's wrong is this. 
this is kilojoules per mole photon. I have to redo this problem. I have to redo this by thinking in terms of joules per bond. And so how much energy is this, not per mole bonds, but how, many, how, how much energy is this joules per bond? And so what would I have to do? Well, if I have a mole of bonds, I, uh, you know, there's a, a mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, so I've got to divide this by Avogadro's number. And so doing that, we get um, 347 divided by 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd is going to be 5.6. Seven six. That's kilojoules. So I'm going to go joules <coughs> times a thousand. So we have five point seven six two times ten to the negative nineteen joules per bond. So I need um, five point seven six two times ten to the minus nineteen joules per bond. Well, visible light's not enough. Because you know the highest energy visible light was violet, and that only had 3.8, right? Or well, we already knew that because the highest energy visible light was violet, and that had less than this in terms of kilojoules per mole. So we have to get comfortable in thinking in different in energy in different in different ways here. And so, what kind of light is this? Well, this is this is. I'm going to redo this. Let's just redo this. Energy is equal to h nu, which is equal to hc over lambda. So let's go ahead and plug it in here. This is going to be 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 um, joules times seconds, and then um, 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second divided by lambda, which is going to be 5 points. Well, actually, lambda is what we're solving for. Sorry. Lambda is equal to um, this, Hc over the energy. So let's go ahead and plug it in. And uh, what do we get? Three point four four times ten to the minus seven meters, which is three hundred and forty four times ten to the minus nine meters, which is three hundred and forty four nanometers. Three hundred and forty four nanometers um, is where uh, this just miss being invisible. It's right over here in the region we call UV. 344 nanometers of UV light. This is um, what we call the maximum wavelength. If we have a wavelength longer than this, it's not going to have enough energy. If we have a, a wavelength shorter than this, it'll have enough energy. So this is why we call it the maximum wavelength. Because um, wavelength and energy are inversely proportional. So this is minimum energy required, which is the maximum wavelength. So this is minimum energy. And therefore, that's going to give us the maximum wavelength. Minimum. Okay. And so uh, UV is uh, dangerous for carbon-carbon bonds. We're mostly, you know, organic chemicals. We're mostly carbon carbon bonds. And so UV can be terribly damaging to our bodies. 
Unfortunately, there are enzymes in your body to repair the damage because UV cleaves your DNA quite a, quite a lot in a normal day. Cleaving me, break the bones. Okay, so this is the nature of light. The nature of light we understand in terms of energy, wavelength, frequency. In terms of energy, it's a little bit complicated because of um, the different ways we think about energy. You know, individual photon, moles of photon, photons per second, this kind of stuff, cumulative. All right, let's go back to this now. All right, so that's okay. Um, we understand that, but still, you know, um, we expect a black body radiation from anything that has electrons that we can excite. So the sun, there's a lot of electrons there that can be excited to different energies. And so we can think of um, making uh, um, light bulbs out of bizarre materials. For example, um, we can think about making a light bulb out of um, hydrogen gas. So can you make a light bulb out of hydrogen gas? Yeah, maybe. So let's have a tube of hydrogen here. H2. Yeah. And then, um, how can you excite the hydrogen gas? Well, what you can do is you put an electrical power source. This hydrogen gas conduct electricity. Hydrogen gas does not conduct electricity. It's not even charged, right? But what can happen is, you know, if this voltage gets high enough, thousands of volts, 5,000 volts. What happens is there's some cosmic radiation and, and there's a chain of events that happens. And so as the hydrogen gets more and more energy, it's put into the hydrogen. Uh, eventually what's going to happen is we're going to go from H2 to H atoms. The bond breaks. How much energy? Is it? 400, over 400 kilojoules a mole that's breaking bond. The bond breaks. As you continue exciting this with energy here, then what we should do, be able to do is hydrogen consists of one proton and one electron. We should be able to excite this electron you know, to different energies. And so that, that, um, that electron, we should be able to excite, you know, like this. We should have a continuum. So if we excite it a little bit, then it'll be IR. In other words, hydrogen should act as a black body. It should act as a black body because that electron, you know, and there are different ways you can think of it. One way it might be orbiting like this. And so then originally people were thinking of electrons orbiting around the nucleus. And so if you have a higher energy orbit, that just means it's a little farther out and moving faster, right? And so, in terms of an orbit, um, we should be able to get a continuum of orbits because we just give it a little bit more kick, and a little bit more kick. And so, what we can do is, we should be able to excite it to any orbit here. So, we'll just say it's in this orbit now. And then, if I want to excite it a lot more, I could excite it to this orbit here, or any orbit in between. So, what I should see is a continuum continuum of possible orbits. And that's what they thought in classical physics, is, you know, you could just have a continuum of orbits because we should just be able to excite the electron a little bit or a lot. It doesn't matter, right? And therefore, a hydrogen atom should act as a black body. So uh, the, the, the different ways you could think of this, you know, higher energy orbit would be just a slightly higher velocity. And so the speed of the electron 
Um, the electron should be able to attain or achieve any speed it wants up to a certain point. Now, once it gets too fast, then the electron will get knocked off the atom. We call it ionization. But as long as it's below that, it should stay on the atom. Now, oops, I'm out of time. Sorry. Didn't. Was